Um, but friends, we've been in this series called Hope in the Dark. And the whole journey that, that we've been in has been trying to find the goodness of God when life itself is not very good. And, and friends, we've been in this series for three weeks now, and, and, and we've been walking through the book of Habakkuk. And what's amazing is the book of Habakkuk is only three chapters long. And so I'm excited to share with you that this morning we find what it is that we're hunting for. Friends, we find um, what it is that God has been kind of helping us take step towards, and I'm so excited. I'm so excited for us to discover it this morning because it's, it's rich. What we've been talking about is uh, two weeks ago, uh, like I shared, we've been talking through this man, his, his life, uh, the book of Habakkuk, this man who, who in the Old Testament, who lived 600 years before Jesus and the start of the church, this regular everyday guy who was a spokesperson for God. He, he stood apart from all the other prophets, all the other spokespeople, because most of them would receive a message from God and, and share it with the world, share it with humanity. But he stood apart because he took a message from the people, and he brought it to God. He came to God with a heavy heart, this burden, this weight in his heart. Have you ever been there? This is this heaviness sinking down inside of you that you just need to share, this get off your chest kind of moment. Well, Habakkuk goes to God, and he, he expresses, in, in chapter one, like we talked about, he expresses, like, God, where are you? Like we look around God and we see how, how, how people are dying, how innocent people are being taken as, as captives to our enemies. God, where are you? Why are you not answering our prayers? Right? He gets really raw as he speaks to God, says, God, where are you? Why are you not you know, actively pursuing and helping us, God? We know that you are God who answers prayers. You're the God of miracles. That God, you are the, the creator of everything. You are perfect, God. You're beyond all this, Lord. We know that nothing is impossible for you, but why are you not helping us? Have you been in that moment? See, I believe for us as a church family, whether you see yourself as somebody who's following Christ or not, whether you've said it out loud or perhaps in your heart, we've, been, we've had moments in life where we've wondered where God is, just like Habakkuk. Whether if it's our boyfriend or our girlfriend who who dumps us, or if we lose a job, or we lose a house, or we lose someone we love. We ask those questions, God, where are you? What's happening to us is not fair. And perhaps we've been praying, asking God to heal us, or to do something in our life, and nothing is changing. And so we wonder, God, what's going on? Have you been there? That very first week, just two weeks ago, God led us to realize that, that it's okay to wrestle with him through these seasons, these hardships. As we saw with his dialogue, his conversation between Habakkuk and God in, in, in chapter one, we see that God gives us permission to wrestle. Sometimes we have this idea that fear, sadness, and anger are wrong emotions to have in life, that they make us weak, right? We don't want to be weak people, so we kind of suppress them and pretend that we don't have them. And especially in our relationship with God, we just pretend and we put on this mask like nothing's wrong, like we have no doubts or struggles or insecurities or anything like that. But God, in that wonderful first chapter, gives us permission to wrestle and to embrace and to vocalize what's happening happening in our life and to speak and bring this stuff to him. And what's amazing is last week as we, as we leaned into chapter 2, we saw what it looks like to wrestle with God. We saw some amazing habits, these healthy habits that Habakkuk showed us that we should um, embrace when we're in the middle of wrestling. We talked about what entertainment there is in a waiting room when we're in a doctor's office or, or whatever it could be. We talked about that and, and just the reality, there are things that God has put in place for us to embrace while we're waiting on him. Things like leaning in and reading scripture and praying and just absorbing all that we can of his word about the faith community, the family of God who surrounds us to lean into our brothers and sisters for encouragement and wisdom. He puts us in place for each other, to sharpen each other, and to, to hold each other up in those seasons. And we talked about how God is going to speak this deep promise into our soul as we're reading Scripture, as we're reading His truth. He's going to speak this promise into us and over us, and we need to acknowledge that and to hold on to it. It becomes this, this anchor that we drop, right? We talked about how maybe we're on the tail race canal, we're taking the boat out, and the tide changes. And the water's racing against us. All that force is racing out to the ocean. Right? We drop that anchor to hold us still in the same way God's going to speak this promise into our soul that keeps us still 
and keeps us grounded. And we also saw last week how essential it is to make sure that we're honoring God when we're in the middle and we're wrestling. Whether it's issues with our spouse that we, we love unconditionally, maybe not because they're loving us first, but because, because we want to honor God, we're going to honor our spouse, we're going to love them or even with our kids, or whatever the season, whatever might be happening in front of us, right? We're going to honor God through it all. We're going to praise God. We're going to worship Him. We're going we're gonna to let Him know that we love Him, and we're not walking away. It was an amazing week that we had last week, and this morning, I'm excited for us to dive into chapter 3, because, because something God is inviting us to realize. As we kind of close out this series, He's, he's trying to open up our eyes to embrace and engage him in a very special way, perhaps a way that we we think we've been engaging him, that we've been connecting with him, but perhaps we've been doing it a little wrong. Have you ever have you ever had a moment in life where you're doing something, you've been doing it one way for so long, and then you realize that you've been doing it wrong, and you're like humiliated and embarrassed, right? Or you see someone else who who's doing something, and you're like, oh, that's totally wrong. Like that's not how you do that, and, and you have that tension in your heart, like like should I help them? Try to stand back and watch, right? I'll wait till it goes a little far before I like step in and try to save the day. See, when I was growing up in my family, um, in middle school and high school, we had a membership to the Y, to the YMCA. And I'm so happy that we just built a YMCA here in Cane Bay that's close, because the one we have here in Monk's Corner is, yeah, I'm just glad we had the one in Cane Bay because it's so brand new and beautiful and amazing. And I'm so excited for one day for Aaron and I to get a, a membership there. But I love the YMCA because it's so different than any other club or, or fitness, workout center, anything like that. Um, I love it because they're, they're pretty much these three groups of people who go there. I mean, I would go there with my brothers and my family, my friends, play basketball, go swimming, right? Uh, all those things growing up. And, and they're pretty much these three groups of people. You see, in the middle, there's about 90%, 80 to 90% of this middle group of people, which is most of us, which is like the average typical person, right? Where, you know, hey, it's okay. There's no pressure. There's no expectation, right? There's no judgment of working out, right? It could be a serious day where you walk in, they're like, hey, Andre, right? It's leg day, right? Leg day, right? But also you can walk in like, no, 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 it's Lay's day, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to sit on the couch and eat some Lay's chips or something like that. No, there's no judgment. Nobody looks at you if you're walking the treadmill and eating a Snickers bar, right? Nobody judges. There's a, there's a big group of people right in the middle. It's just all of us, regular, everyday people. Some days are pretty serious. Some days are like, eh, I'm just in the hot tub, right? Nobody's judging me. It's amazing. There's a waiting line at the vending machine, right? Right, not in, in line for any of the workout equipment, right? There's just everybody is normal right there. And there's there's these few people who are like five to six, seven percent, right? Who who are very different. They take it super serious, right? To them, they're training to be the next Michael Phelps. So they jump in that pool and they're doing laps, right? They're laps back and forth, back and forth. Like, yeah, man, I'm doing this, right? They're, they're drinking the, the, the protein shakes, right? They're eating the energy bars, all those things. They have the Gatorade and all that stuff. And they're taking it serious, right? They're in the corner, right? Trying to be the next Hulk Hogan. Just, ah, uh, there's lifting weights and all those things. They're those people who take it super serious. And if you're lucky, there's a small class of people that you're going to see at the YMCA who, who don't really fall in either of the two categories. They more or less fall in a category like this. Chloe, if we can put this picture up, please. I don't always go to the gym, but when I do, I have no idea what I am doing. There are people who fall into this category who sit down at like the leg lifting and they, they try to do like arm curls or something like that, right? Who use the equipment completely wrong. And it's just like hilarious. I know I am not the only one who has seen videos on YouTube and Facebook. People using different equipment, that's totally wrong. Like there's a reason why there's a diagram printed on the side. Step one, sit down in the chair. Step two, put your legs like this, right? There's, there's a diagram that tells you what to do. And there's still these few people, rare, very, very creative people, right? I mean, they, they have no idea how to use this. They kind of create an idea of how to use this machine. But it's funny. Small class of people who are utilizing a, a piece of equipment and exercise. And they think they're doing it so right, so right, so right, so right. And they found out they're doing it wrong. Friends, I, I'm convinced, I really believe that there's this exercise, there's this part of our faith that God has blessed us with that we've been using wrong. Because we, we think we're doing it right. 
we're so sure because maybe we've grown up in church or we grew up with Christian parents or, 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 or it's easy, we see it on TV or, or, or whatever it is. This is going to be an overcomplicated thing, but yet for some reason when we access and have this connecting point with God by utilizing this element of our relationship with Him, for some odd reason, nothing is happening. Friends, I would love for us to read what that is together. In Habakkuk chapter 3, it's on page 443 in some of the blue Bibles that we have sitting on the seats. Well, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 1. If we can read this together. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. A prayer. What's interesting is that through this whole time in this series, Every, every verse, every chapter through this book of the Bible is a conversation between Habakkuk and God. And for some reason, this is the very first moment we actually see the word prayer. I mean, come on, isn't, isn't prayer, isn't prayer simple? Isn't prayer just us talking to God, having this conversation? Isn't that just the, the gist of what it is, right? I mean, he's been talking to God back and forth. We've seen, we've seen Habakkuk speak, and then God speak back to him, and Habakkuk speak back to him, and then this dialogue back and forth. But for some reason, for the very first time in this whole book of all this back and forth, back and forth, for the very first time, we see the word prayer. And for some reason, we see this word pop up in this very first verse in this chapter. As we, as we hear in a moment, we'll read through a lot of it. But, but at the very end, we see how Habakkuk finds the very hope that we're looking for. Friends, see, what I'm convinced of, you see, what I want is to really humble ourselves and put our hearts in a position to, to learn. Right? If we can do this, if we can really position ourselves to receive and be convicted and be challenged and stretched this morning, I really believe... We're going to discover this, this amazing connecting point, this part of our faith that God has given us that perhaps we've been doing wrong this whole time. And I'm so grateful that here in chapter 3, we get a diagram printed on the side for us. Because here's the reality. I know I'm not the only one. That in the midst of hardship, in the midst of, of chaos in life, and we feel so alone, we've prayed, right church? We've prayed. And yet nothing is happening. We've prayed for God to give us strength, and yet we feel depleted. We feel for God to comfort us, and yet we feel so alone and exhausted. People tell us, I'll just pray about it, right? Or we say in our culture, I'll be praying for you, don't worry. And yet nothing's happening. And maybe I'm the only one who's seeing this. Maybe I'm crazy. But I don't think I am. We feel just out of breath and beaten down by life. We try praying, and maybe at first we feel some traction, but then it's like it goes dry, and we don't hear from God, and, and nothing happens. Friends, I want us to lean in to what Habakkuk is trying to show us, because because honestly, here in chapter 3, we need to learn these two essential truths about what prayer is. I am so convinced that like Habakkuk, if we understand and grab a hold of these truths, then we will really unlock, unlock God's hope through prayer. That we will really find His hope when we pray. When we feel like everything is going wrong, when there's this disconnect in our marriage, when things with our kids are strange, not going right, when there's all this fighting in our house, or the money's not there, and there's all this stress inside of, I really believe that we're going to be able to find God's hope through prayer, prayer if we embrace these two essential truths. So I think on one side of the coin that we have to embrace, we've got to acknowledge is that, is that prayer is not so much just us speaking to God. That it is an element of it. But what's important for us to understand is that, that prayer is not so much an expression, just kind of expressing whatever we want to God, but prayer is this exchange that happens between us and God. 
understand that prayer is this exchange. It's kind of, it's kind of this deal that we make when we're, we're giving certain things to him as we're sharing and we're speaking. We're giving whatever it is, our worries, our fear, all these things. We're giving it to God and he's exchanging it for more of his hope and his peace. That is what prayer is supposed to be. But the reason why we're not experiencing that, the reason why we're not seeing that happen and come to fruition in our life is because of the other side of the coin. Is that we're not giving all of what prayer is meant to be. Could you imagine if you looked up on KBB, the value of your car, the trade-in value is $8,000, let's just say. Could you imagine walking up to a dealership and saying, hey, here's a steering wheel and here's a tire. Listen here, here's, here's my car, right? Can I get $8,000 for my next one? Like, that'd be crazy, right? Like, no one would do that. They'd look at you like, where's the rest of the car, right? No one would expect to walk into a dealership and hand the cassette player or the DVD player writer. No one would expect it to hand his pieces to, to, to the dealership and expect that full trade in value. Understand that we've been handing some bits and pieces to God and, and we've been really good at these bits and pieces. We've been great at them, but we're missing so much more to the body of what prayer is. And so we're not getting our trade in value of what we see happen in scripture because we read these stories of people praying praying and God moves when we've been talking about Habakkuk's story the entire time and how he is just hopeless how he's terrified he's full of anxiety and he's yelling out to God God what's going on God where are you what's happening is so unfair God what are you doing do you even know what you're doing God and yet here in chapter 3 Habakkuk says God I trust you God, you are my hope and you are my strength. He says these words and they're real to him. And so I want us to lean into what happens here in chapter 3 and what he shows for us because it's real and rich. He shows us these three different elements, these two, three different types and aspects of prayer, some of which we've been missing, that I really want us to embrace this morning. You see, the very next verse that Habakkuk says, and and chapter 3, verse 2, is this right here. He says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day. Maybe in your Bible, just underline, repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, um, in wrath remember mercy. Make them known, God. In wrath, but remember mercy, Lord. Please repeat, repeat your power, your delivering power, your miraculous power, Lord, of what we see in Scripture and, and, and what we share in our families in the history, right? What we've talked about in our culture for, for, for thousands of years, what we've celebrated about you. Repeat that today. He says that here in, in, in verse 2. I mean, this element of prayer is, is what's called an asking prayer. And this is not necessarily something foreign to us because this is the one element of prayer that we're very good at. This is the one part that we're very good at, that we're, we're great at praying to God and asking Him for things. And it's not wrong. We should not be humiliated or ashamed. I've met people who say, you know, God, I'm just going to only ask you for this one thing. Right? Have you ever met somebody who said that? Maybe you've said that before, but God, I'm only going to ask you for this one thing. No, God wants you to ask him for help. He loves it. That is why we call God our Father, because he's got that, parent, that, that parental uh, characteristic where he loves his children coming to him for help. Listen, teenagers, students, your parents love it when you come to your mom or your dad for help or your grandpa and grandma for help. They love it. Now I'm going to draw a line. Because if you run to them and say, Mom, Dad, the, the Wi-Fi is not working. Ah, no, they're not going to care. But if you go to them and say, Mom, when you were my age, did you feel this pressure too? Did you feel this pressure from your friends to do these certain things or to do this with that boy? Did you feel it too? Dad, did you feel like there are all these expectations of you? That you had to be a man and be tough and all these things. Did you feel that too? Parents, we want to help. And students, hear me. We want to help. And perhaps in your perspective, mom and dad and grandpa and grandma are from the dinosaur age. And they couldn't possibly understand. But realize that that's true then. Maybe, maybe they really are from the dinosaur age, but understand then they, they've faced some of life's biggest beasts. 
in their life today to tell the tale of it. That they've been through things. The same pressures and the same insecurities. They've wrestled with it all, and even perhaps even today, and they want to help. This beautiful part of who God is, He wants us to ask Him for help. He wants us to ask Him over and over again, and it's okay, it's not wrong. He wants us to plead and, and ask Him for help with our friends or, or in our relationships or whatever it is, our career or next steps, we're trying to figure out what's next in life. God wants us to ask for His input, His help, His direction. He wants us to ask. But this, is, this next part's where the rubber meets the road. And this next element is the hard truth. And we've got to accept this, right? We love the easy truth, but we've got to accept the hard truth, okay? If you're ready to accept the hard truth, say, go ahead. Go ahead. I love it. Awesome. 19 verses is the full length of Habakkuk's prayer. And only verse 2 is an asking prayer. You see, what is 5% of Habakkuk's prayer tends to be 95% of our prayer. Somebody say, wow. 5% of what is Habakkuk's prayer tends to be 95 to 100%. We can be honest. It tends to be 100% of what we pray. There is more to this. There's more, and God is inviting us to embrace these other elements of prayer and, and to really connect with him on this deep, intimate level of, level of talking to our Heavenly Father. You see what happens in here in, in, in chapter 3, this another aspect, this another type of prayer that we see, we see kind of towards the end, and it's several verses long. It's verses 16 to 19, and, and it says this. Read with me. It's on page 443. It says, I heard... And my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones. What imagery. And my legs trembled. Yet, underline yet in your Bible right there. Highlight it on your phone. Yet, I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig trees, listen, just highlight this whole verse 17 and 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines. And though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, though there are sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord and I will be joyful in God my Savior. Wow. Verse 19. The, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He gives me endurance to charge forward. He enables me to tread on the heights. He, he brings me from the valley and picks me back up to the mountain peaks with him. Amazing. Here in just these couple of verses, we see this another beautiful element of prayer, and that is what's called an abiding prayer. This part of prayer is when we're praying to God, saying, God, listen, I'm in you. I'm with this Holy Spirit. Be in me. Give me strength. God, help me to walk with you. Jesus, I love you. I'm walking in step with you, and I'm going to be faithful to you. I love that in our D groups recently. If you're not a part of our D groups, then I really encourage you to look forward to them the next cycle that they come around. But our D groups, we've been discovering together in these discipleship groups, we've been discovering together hearing the voice of God, and we read through uh, Daniel, right? And in Daniel chapter 3, we see this amazing story of, of these three men, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we see how, God, how, how King Nebuchadnezzar builds this, this idol, right? And he tells everybody to bow down. Maybe you're familiar to this story, or maybe you're like me and you remember the Veggie Tales. But anyway, but they, they see uh, this giant altar, right? Built, built up um, uh, to worship this false god and worship the king. And so, 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 you know, king gives the command, right? Everybody, you know, when you hear these instruments play, everybody fall down and, and bow down and worship. And, and these three men choose not to. Because they're following God. And so what happens next? They, they get pulled, they get punished, and, and the king says, listen, I'm going to throw you into this fire if you don't bow down before my altar, before my, my idol that I built. I'm going to throw you into this giant furnace. We're going to heat it up seven times greater, and, and you will not survive. And they say what? They say, even if our God does not save us, we will still not bow down. 
See, a huge part of faith is, is yes, depending and trusting that God will deliver, but a huge part of faith is being faithful when he doesn't. Wow. This abiding prayer is what we pray and say, God, listen, I know it's okay that you're not answering me. It's okay that you're not healing me like I want you to. It's okay that these insecurities are there still. But Jesus, I just want to be with you. Help me, please, to walk with you and to remain faithful and to not grow weary, God, but to remain strong and courageous, God. I want to remain in you and abide with you. That, that connection, God, I want that. And this prayer Habakkuk prays for, for four verses, which makes up 20% of the chapter. Let me ask you this. Do you pray asking prayers more than abiding prayers? Because he prays this abiding prayer five, I'm sorry, four times more, long, long, longer than his asking prayer. Saying, God, I am with you. I am with you no matter what. Would you let me know that you are with me? me. Sandwiched between these two types of prayers, between asking and abiding, is one other type of prayer. And it's a type of prayer that we often don't pray. It's a type of prayer that we especially don't pray when, when things are hard. But we've got to embrace the hard truth. Amen, church? And we've got to grow. Because we want His hope. We want His hope and his peace when things are crashing down around us. I won't read all verses 4, 4 to 15, but I will read a couple. They should also be right here on the screen. Verse 3 says, His glory, this is Habakkuk speaking to God, so your glory covered the heavens and, and your praise filled the earth. Your splendor was like the sunrise rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. And later he says in verse 13, you came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. See what Habakkuk prays here in this moment is what's called an adoration prayer. This type of prayer is is where we give God to God praise, where we recognize Him, where we pray and we adore Him, saying, God, you are good. God, you are beyond me. Father, you are, you are wonderful. You are, you are miraculous, God. You are beyond what I can even understand. You are infinite, Father. Nothing compares to you. This side of prayer is so important for us to embrace, and I know it's hard. It's hard for us to want to say this about God when we feel like he's doing nothing. But that's why it's so important for us to be reading scripture and being in a community of faith. Because what happens is we, we remember these stories of what happens in scripture. We remember those amazing stories of God parting the sea for a million people to march through. Whoa! We remember the days when those million people, right, those million plus people had no food and they were in the desert and God fed them every single day, miraculously fed them. And when Jesus, right, when Jesus would go into communities and he'd go to the lost and the broken and, and the downtrodden and the ignored and the marginalized, he'd go to those people and he'd show them unconditional love and he embraced them and healed them. Right? We know who our God is, and we need to be remembering these stories when we adore him, when we, we adore him in our prayer. And when we hear stories of what God is doing in other people's life, we cannot become bitter and say, God, why are you doing that for them but not for me? We've got to give glory to God and adore him. Say, God, thank you. Thank you for how you're providing financially, right, for this other family, right, when they had no money left in the bank. God, you provided for them. Lord, thank you for how you've stepped in and you've saved their son who left the house. Thank you, God, for your, you know, your healing this person. Thank you, God. We've got to remember. We've got to remember and adore God for these things. And it's so important, even though it's hard, to adore him and remember what he's done in our life. We can't have tunnel vision, only seeing what's right now in front of us. We've got to widen our lens and, and recognize that God has stepped in. In so many moments before right now. And say, God, thank you for what you've done. 
Thank you for how you've answered these prayers. Thank you for that blessing in our life. Thank you. Thank you, God. We've got to be thankful and remember as we, as we adore God in our prayer. And listen, this is the hard truth. Habakkuk prays this prayer for 14 verses, which makes up 75% of his prayer. 75%. Now, hear me, I don't believe that there's a formula for how we can access and connect with God. Please, let's not, let's not pick up that mistake. It's not like we can do A, B, C, and D, and we're always going to get the same outcome. Right? We can't play this, our favorite worship song one day in the car, right? We're like, yes, I feel the Holy Spirit. We're worshiping in our car, and the next day I play the same song and the same thing. The no, 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 God is not a formula. But I am convinced that if we begin to reportion re, re, re how we pray, we're asking prayers right now, we're 95 to 100% of what we pray, we bring them down and begin to model this same diagram of prayer, and we, we kind of increase our, our abiding prayer, and we raise our prayer of adoration through the roof. I really believe we can just see what God does in our life. And I can't promise you that, that he's going to answer. Even in Habakkuk's lifetime, God does not deliver his people. This is hard. I mean, this, this is hard truth, but we've got to embrace it. God does not deliver them from the Babylonians who come and conquer them and kill Habakkuk and kill so many of his family and his friends, people he loves. God does not deliver them from that. Yet I do promise this. I really believe that this will happen in our life, that although we won't necessarily see God fulfill and answer our prayers and what we want him to do, we, get, we will believe, I'm sorry, we will be able to, to be filled up with his hope and his peace. I am blown away what, with what Habakkuk says at the very end. I don't believe it's on the screen, but we did read it earlier in verse 19. The sovereign Lord is my strength. my king who is in heaven, who is above all, who is over all. He is my strength. Boom. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. And he gives me the endurance to march forward, the strength to push on, to not be held down or to be beaten down and left there on the wayside. He gives he makes my feet like the feet of a deer, and he enables me to tread on the heights. Although I may be in a valley season, the circumstances around me may be crumbling down. I believe that God will give us that hope and that peace where although maybe life around us may not change immediately, but he will calm what's happening inside of us, and we, we'll, we will feel that intimacy rise with God, and we will hear his voice. I really believe I really believe that if we properly proportion our prayers, we will see God move inside of us and perhaps even around us. I really believe this. I'm convinced by this. So if you're begging and, and aching for that real sense of hope and that peace that Jesus readily gives to us, listen, I encourage you to adjust how you pray and pray this way. If you pray 10 minutes a day, then let 30 seconds of that prayer be a prayer. We can go ahead and just leave them off for now. Thank you. I encourage you for 30 seconds of that prayer to be a prayer of asking. To be a prayer of asking, let two minutes Two minutes for that prayer. Listen, let it be an abiding prayer and let seven and a half minutes be a prayer of adoration if we follow that same, that same diagram that God lays out for us here in this moment. I'm really convinced by that. I encourage you today and tomorrow and the next day as you pray to be praying that and speaking that in your soul as you're driving to work or as you're walking to class or whatever it is that you're doing, just be praying inside of you saying, God, listen, I trust you. God, I lean on you. Father, I ask that you help me in this way. Lord, would you bring good friends into my life? I feel so alone and like there's no one I can trust on. 
trust and lean on? Would you bring good friends into my life? God, I'm looking for someone to get married to. I want that right person to step in front of me. God, would you please provide that, right? Bring that into my life. Or, or God, my kids, my kids, they were sweet when they were younger, but now they're, they're not terrible, but they're difficult. God, would you please, please bring a peace and direction into their soul? God, would you please lead them? Ask, 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 and then abide. Say, God, I am yours. I'm not going to walk away, Lord. I am yours. I belong to you. I'm a child of God. You've changed my life. My soul is in your hands. Jesus, you are my king, Lord. I rest in you, Holy Spirit. Fill me, Lord, today. Fill me, direct me, guide me. May my steps be in line with your steps. May the things that I love and chase after be the same things that you love and want me to chase after. God, would you help? Help me to live how you want me to live. And will we pray that prayer of adoration saying, God, you are good. Even though right now it's tough, God, you are good. Although the money's not there, God, and the the stress is eating us, God, I know that you are able to provide, God, you are good. Lord, nothing is impossible to you. You are the king and creator of this universe. Lord, nothing is past your reach. God, you are good. I really believe we're going to pray this way and really focus our eyes on the goodness of God. Then we will feel his goodness radiate inside of us. And we pray together. God, you are good. This whole journey has been about seeing your goodness when life is not good. Father, would you lift us up? Would you pour your strength and encouragement into us? Father, we belong to you. Lord, fill us in this moment. Holy Spirit, fill us with your strength. Fill us with your hope and your peace. Father, I really pray for those who are hungry here, who are aching for more, God, would you fill them up? Fill the aches and the cracks of their soul, God. Please. Jesus, we love you. And we're living for you. It is in your holy and amazing name that we pray together. Amen.